first thing is, uh, and these are premises, okay, and some of them are content one in the panel will disagree with them. Uh, I think everything happening around us is in some ways good, right, because it, it, it probably uh, indicates a cleansing of the system that's taking place. Uh, for a long time, India was a exception driven society right um, it 's not a it wasn 't a rules based society um, it, everything happened on the basis of exception, depending on who you were, whom you knew, uh, what kind of uh, incentives you would offer people, and things like that. The second uh, premise is that I, I think what has happened today has also happened because there is a lot of uh, information out there which wasn't out there before, right? Um, because uh, I think it's presumptive to believe, uh, or rather it's presumptuous to believe that a lot of corruption suddenly sprung up overnight. Um, I, I just think that um, the kind of torchlight we're using to shine on it is probably a lot better now. Uh, some of it is because of RTI and, and you know, uh, um, I, I know this also from experience because my newsroom has a lot of people who collect information through RTI and I think the quality of information and the kind of information that's available through that, uh, while you can quibble about people not responding, I still think it's far more information than was available before. The second thing, and, and you know, a couple of panels before this, there was a panel on media where everyone was abusing the TV channels and um, uh, people who've, who happen to read uh, the newspaper that the newsroom I work for put out will know that my views on TV channels are fairly similar. But I still think that TV channels do perform a function and that is to get the information out there. Their, their journalistic processes are all pretty bad. They don't do due diligence of any kind. But, but I think they still amplify the message and get it out there. And, uh, and of course, they're, they're far too quick to judge people. So, so you know, if, if a scandal happens, the next minute that guy is being like, judged and uh, sentenced and everything else. Uh, but the fact is they're amplifying it and getting that information out there. So you, you have that big uh, surge of information now, which, which wasn't there before. Uh, and, and I think uh, the unfortunate thing is when, when you have this information on one side and, and you have the kind of governance quality that you have now, uh, you're realizing that there are a lot of chinks in governance, right? I mean, some would say there are only chinks. You know, there's, there is no wall, it's just a series of chinks. Uh, so I'd like both of you to comment on this and on any other thing you may want to comment on and, and we'll, we'll get some sort of discussion going. I'm going to start with Bharat. Okay, thank you very much, friends. Great to, great to be here. You know, as, as Sukumar said, the, the discussion on governance, ethics, corruption, and all, everything else in between, is really a, it's a huge canvas to cover. And therefore, to make it simple and to address some of the points that you made, I would like to, to put these ideas into three buckets. And I'll start off with the, the first bucket, which is the bucket of the individual. And I think let's not forget that when we talk about things like ethics or corruption or the decline in integrity or, or the behavior being inappropriate, I think we can't leave out the human being, the individual, from any discussion on this. And on the individual, I like to say that there is definitely, definitely a, a slightly contorted sense of self, which in a, in a way drives a foolish kind of a pursuit of things material far beyond what is humanly necessary. Now, the, the f interesting thing is, if we look at ourselves as travelers who will live on planet Earth for, let's say, 80 or 90 years at best, the need to acquire and the need to collect needlessly diminishes. But then the sense of self that we have these days or the understanding of ourselves these days is so warped, so clouded. We have forgotten that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So that is a distinctive factor which we possibly can't ignore. The second bucket that I would like to touch upon is the fact that when it comes to good governance, while you de definitely need leaders who have a moral backbone, a strong self of uh, sense of uh, you know what is right and what is wrong that is not enough because it is very very difficult even for the best of us to be completely on the straight road of doing what i call the hard right when the easy wrong is so much easier to do 
So we need institutions and systems to ensure that we remain on the right track. We need rules, we need uh, a constitution, if I may say, put it in the context of a country, to enable us to follow what is the right thing to do in all circumstances. Now, even institutions, ladies and gentlemen, have got to be managed by people with high standards of ethics, who can speak up their minds, who can say no, even in the face of pressure. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, happy you sort of um, structured that in such a way that you're looking at the individual aspect of it, the leadership aspect of it, as well as the environment or the ecosystem aspect of it. Uh, just to clarify, I, um, in your first point, you, you just stopped short, short of like sort of taking it to its logical denouement. But are you saying that individual value systems have also eroded to such, a, uh, such an extent that we are seeing all that, is, that we are seeing? <coughs> you know, uh, I would say individual value systems as much as individual understanding of who we really are. In our ancient India, if you go back to the time of the Mahabharata, when the Mahabharata was first talked about, you know, this, the, there was this understanding that you are playing a role. Arjun was playing a role in the battlefield. Today, we don't see ourselves as playing a role. We are saying we are the role. I am the Prime Minister, so everything I do is, is just that. Whereas we have to understand that the roles we play are temporary things that we have to do in a lifespan of 80 or 90 years, and after a while we've got to drop it. That ability to think of it as something we've got to drop is not happening anymore. Uh, thanks, Bharat. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jitendra Bhargava to speak. Um, I don't know how many of you have read his book. It's called The Descent of Air India. You should read it. Uh, it's in many ways a good reflection of all that uh, we are speaking about today. You see, of all the three buckets that he narrated here, the second one appeals to me the most and I will dwell on it further. He said there need to be rules and there need to be bodies to ensure that they are implemented, etc. <laughs> Now, what is there in the government sector? A government company, if one of the reasons you attribute for the lack of efficiency is the multiplicity of checks and balances in government sector. You have the parliamentary committee, you have the board, you have the CAG, you have the CVC, and you have numerous other bodies which are there to check on you. How is it that when you have multiple checks, bodies being instituted, and they meet regularly, they go through the rituals regularly, deduce, and mind you, I would also add media to all the bodies because public sector companies and government bodies are subjected to greater scrutiny than private sector companies. Then how is it that in the last five, seven, ten years, did we see Air India being virtually decimated in broad daylight, so to say? It was happening, people were noticing it. I have narrated in some of my lectures earlier, that since it's an aviation thing, you have an aircraft when JRD Tata left it in 1978 at a height of 33,000 feet. And you had in the cockpit the board of directors of Air India, the chairman of Air India. And in the first class cabin, you have the senior management of Air India. In the rest of the aircraft, you have the union and you have the other management, middle management and the lower staff. Each one of them is seeing through the window that the aircraft is coming down, but doing nothing about it. And the air traffic control, which is, a, as we all know, at the airport is the tar, are seated the minister, the bureaucrats of the ministry. They are also seeing the plane coming down, but doing nothing about it. Now, when you have so many bodies failing at one time, what are we coming to? Now, all you need is, everybody knows, you need a minister under our cabinet federal system. You will have the bureaucracy. You have a chairman who's supposed to be visionary. You have to have a board of directors, including some of the private sector stalwarts. We had, for example, N. Vagul, former chairman of ICICI Bank on the board, as an independent director. And some of the worst decisions from the financial point of view were taken during his time. I can understand that a bureaucrat may not be able to raise his voice. The chairman may be under political direction to take a certain stance. But what stopped an independent director of the standing of N. Vagul to come out and say, look, these decisions I trust just can't be pursued. It was happening. People were noticing it. Now, when I had my book launch in Delhi at this very venue in another hall, 
I said, look, the media has missed 200 front page stories. Because there were so many things happening in Air India which were worthy of front page reporting, but were not reported. So if the parliamentary committees were the only ones, I would say, which have come out unscathed in the whole thing. Because Sita Ram Yachuri is one parliamentary committee, V. Kishore, v. Kishore Chandradev, another committee, pinpointed what was going wrong and what needed to be set in motion. But what are parliamentary committees? They are recommendatory bodies. Their recommendation need not be accepted. For example, when the merger took place and this committee said, you need stable leadership in Air India, number one. Number two, you need a professional to run Air India. What did the government do? The opposite. In six years of merger, you had five chief executives. They said, appoint a professional. They kept appointing IAS people. Now the question is, this is happening in broad daylight. Has any media guy questioned? Has anybody editorialized it? To say, look, you are playing around with a company which was not very long ago, an iconic company and a national pride. Now, it has happened. Now, the question that comes in is, in part of this today's discussion, that you know things are going wrong, you're not attending to it. More and more rules are being created, you're not adhering to the rules. Now, I have in my book, when I was writing the book, to tell you very frankly, I knew I'm going to upset a lot of people. I knew I'm going to get legal notices from people. But I said, I must put it in public domain. If all these bodies have failed, I at least want to get off my chest that, look, I have placed in public domain facts that warranted greater scrutiny and people held accountable. The courts are taking their time. There is a special leave petition in the Supreme Court. There are other petitions that Subramanian Swami has now filed. And let's see when something comes out in my book contributing to those petitions. Now, when we looked at it, and mind you, I, have a part, I was executive director and I was watching it from within and putting papers on record if that could be of any help. And knowing fully well, the bureaucracy will not support me. There are certain code of conduct that I've, I'm governed by. I can't transgress them unless I want to be sacked publicly and humiliated, kind of a thing to go by. Now, when I was, John Elliott is here and I was talking to him, and I said, look what was happening here. Simple commercial sense is that when you are in deep financial crisis, what will you do? Any businessman will first thing is do defer capital expenditure, which can be deferred. Try and consolidate your finances. What did we do in open broad daylight? Went to the other extreme, big ticket expenditure. Let's say convert, refurbish 747, old 747, 400s in the fleet at a cost of 400 crore. 2004, five. Even while the sixth aircraft is being refurbished, you abandon the project. Calls for a scrutiny. Can you imagine that in today's environment, you can get away with it? Even while you're abandoning it, you're converting four A310s into freighters for cargo business. You get the four aircraft converted at $32 million total cost and operate these aircraft for six weeks and say, my God, they are fuel guzzlers. They are uneconomic. So you again finish it. Now the question is, it's happening in quick succession. The board is there. Why is nobody raising this issue? Leasing of aircraft, you don't need aircraft, your own aircraft lying on ground, but you go ahead and lease aircraft. You do not want to change rules or relax rules when it's going to be beneficial to the airline. But when it is going to be beneficial to the people who are running the airline, you're relaxing rules. Now, this is all happening in everybody's knowledge. There are people putting it on record, but yet nothing has happened. So when he says you can have rules, yes, you have rules. But the question comes in, can you subject people to scrutiny and take them to task? There was another issue that we had, and which was the most classic case, which I've been narrating at all of my sessions with related to the book. I said, when there was a need to consolidate finances, enhance revenues, cut down on cost, you said, let's introduce at the airports what is called biometric system which means when you're going through the security, your iris identifies and allowed to go through. The tender gets floated. The value given in the tender as government offices would do normally 75 lakhs of rupees. You get 28 companies to bid. You reject 26 of them. Two Canadian companies are selected. One of them is a fake company, right? The value of the tender is 486 crores. Thanks to some of my colleagues in the finance department to put it on record, 
and said, how can you go about doing it? Because the country which, ex which is the best as far as these biometrics are concerned is America, Homeland Securities. Now you keep the value at 75 lakhs because then you don't need to float a global tender. So you are basically circumventing every rule that's happening. Now my question that comes in is, and if you remember, and this is also the Canadian newspaper quoted of a bribery case involving thing, this is the same thing I'm talking about. But this was 1486 crores of expenditure that we could save. Now I put a straight question in the book, and I said, we are now in 2013. This was happening in 2006. If we don't need it in 2013, who asked Air India to float a tender? I want to know the name of the person. Raful Patel may say he's not the involved person, but I still want to know who is it. Now when I look at it, and that's where when I put this book, and I look at these ethics, and we can keep talking about it, the RTI, the vigilant media, the parliamentary debates, and all those kind of a thing, my faith has been shaken badly. It's been shattered. I said, look, I was a whole lot of people guilty, and you have multiple systems. I've also been saying it as a caveat. I said, look, everything in the book is not everything that has happened to Air India. There's much more, many, many more things that have happened to Air India which needed to be put in, needs to be put in public domain. Now, question is, Air India, high-profile company, should have logically deserved greater attention in the media and by the people who matter. Now, one reason when I said, I've written the book, A, because I want people to be taken to task, B, I don't want any of the other Navratnas of Indian public sector, or the temples of modern India, as Pandit Nehru described it, to have a sim to meet a similar fate. Now let's begin with this and then we can take Yeah, sure. Thank you. I, I think you raised a lot of issues. Um, I know you want to respond to them and I'm going to let, uh, allow you to respond to them right now. But I also want you to, along with your response, uh, because he spoke about public sector and private sector. And it's not as if the private sector is immune to Absolutely. such things, right? Uh, we, we, we do know that it happens in the private sector also. Uh, but it, it obviously, there are certain measures that you have in the private sector, especially if you're a listed company, uh, which seems to prevent this from happening all too frequently, although you can say that these regulations are only as good as they're flouted. You know, the recent events at NSCL, which is, you know, clearly shows that it, it, it fell below, you know, uh, fell between so many regulators, although it was uh, supposed to be in an area which was regulated. So can you just comment on that? Yeah, two immediate responses. I think Jitinder has made a very, very strong case for us to reflect and, and figure out really what happened. But, you know, two or three things that come to my mind immediately. And the comparison is, is, is a bit between the private sector and the public sector. You know, until the Tatas ran Air India, one thing you can be sure about, it was a cohesive entity with one set of objectives. Profitability and customer satisfaction and, and making sure that passengers had a great time flying the airline. The moment the government took over, suddenly this cohesive corporate entity, it may have seemed on the outside like being cohesive even now. Internally, however, the three or four major stakeholders had differential objectives. Those from the political ecosystem had one objective. Those who from, were from operations had a different objective. Those who were from procurement or from capital expenditure side had another objective. And when you have the same organization having multiple objectives, you obviously will have the most influential winning. And in this case, Air India has gone down because it was three or four different and more very powerful vested interests in the organ within the organization actually pulling in different directions. So that's my immediate response to yeah. this point. Now. How does the private sector take care of this? Frankly, the private sector is, is equally prone to these things. So I don't want to make this distinction at all. It's all about us as human beings. We could probably be, you know, uh, erring a little bit more in the public sector because of the political ecosystem being, you know, a little, uh, the place being awash with all that. But the fact remains that the three buckets I spoke about are as critical in the private sector as they are else elsewhere. And I think the key then comes to leadership. How forceful is the leader? How capable is the leader of showing moral courage? How often can the leader say, I do not want to be party to this rotten decision. I will step down now and make a, have a press conference where I speak about this. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but we in India have become so immune to accepting things. I mean, 
absolutely blatantly wrong things, we as citizens just let them pass. And I'm sorry, Jitender, but that no, is I, part no, of the thing no, which kind of gets my clarify, goat. No, the only point I'll differ with you, it is not government owner per se is at fault. Don't forget Air India was nationalized in 1953. But as long as J.R.D. Tata was running it as a professional management, till 1978, Air India was a great airline. So it is not the ownership, it's the lack of professionalism. But coming to the point of the privatization, since we're talking of the aviation sector, Vijay Mahalia is King Fisher. Right, it's a private company. I wrote an article in Times of India in February 2012, and they gave a lovely title to it, Titanic Fate or Satyam Way which basically meant that if you don't tag, it'll go down like this, like the Titanic. Satyam way was that get this guy out of the Kingfisher, get a professional company to run, who know how to run an airline. Because when he spoke to me after my television appearances, and he spoke, he says, why, why is media hyping this kind of a thing? Nothing is wrong. I said, sorry, Mr. Malia, I have dealt with more journalists than anybody else in the country. Don't fault the journalist. Look at yourself first. And you are at fault because you believe you're doing a great job. You come from a business sector, which is liquor business, where you make 40% margin. And you've entered an industry where the margin is 2%. So it calls for total different skill sets to run an airline. You can't be applying the principles of a liquor business onto the airline industry and say it's going to be happening. So when people said Kingfish, a great airline, they had valets at the airport, they had lounges, they had food, all the kind of thing. I said, yes, but it was two percent kind of a thing to go by. You can run an airline, a first class airline, but with deep losses. If that you can sustain it, good luck to him. Okay, I'm uh, going to get Dr. Bhaskar Rao to come in now. I think uh, we had an interesting uh, uh, arguments. The public or private, the proof of the pudding is the how well uh, the service is delivered. And unfortunately, one of the indicators that uh, has uh, been brought out for uh, more than a, several years has been the corruption. That is, the prevalence of corruption has been our preoccupation. To judge a public or private service, how well it is governed or what kind of governance is given. In this, uh, I, and unfortunately, the movements at uh, local level, national level, and uh, are issue-based, they all have become isolated, ad hoc, and uh, never really picked up a momentum to really make a difference in any of these services. There are isolated events, uh, examples are there, of course. But then, uh, in more recent years, since 2005, to be more specific, the media, as has been mentioned by uh, Barji and uh, Bargoji, has uh, really increased the coverage of corruption by 150%. I have uh, here a chart which gives how the, the print media and the television, more specifically, has been covering. We have done a lot of experiments uh, in uh, the way they are covered. Uh, we have given awards and all that. But the point I am trying to make is, while they, have, uh, they were responsible, they played a very positive role in exposing many of them. But at the same time, I totally share uh, Mr. Bargo's view on this uh, in this regard. The structure of reporting, the structure of reporting is such that they have not really, I mean, one could uh, academically uh, say, the more the media coverage, the more the corruption. This is an argument that one could uh, talk about, not just about corruption, but about the, uh, the crime and so on and so forth. I will leave it at that, and uh, I will not go into the more details. The third aspect is there are so many books have been written, and most of them are either journalists or bureaucrats about the governance and uh, taking the corruption as an indicator of uh, good or bad or what kind of governance is there, whether it is in private or public sector. Uh, if you really look at it, all of them, what difference they made, in which way we are heading, they have not really made uh, the kind of uh, uh, contribution towards understanding the corruption, because obviously the corruption, as the preoccupation has been at the, uh, what I call the higher level, the big corruption, or uh, corruption involving the, the important personalities, political personalities more specifically, that has been the preoccupation. The preoccupation has started with the citizen and the corruption only when we took up about 12 years ago, that what 
the good governance definition need to be re-examined and repositioned. And that repositioning should be the citizen should be the center. So from that point of view, we have identified 18 basic public services. Many of them are now becoming privatized slowly, but uh, very fast in metro cities. But the point is, of these 18, there are 12 public, basic public services which a citizen uses at least once. Some of them are used more than uh, thrice, but there is at least once every citizen uh, has to use that. So we started looking at that, uh, that is, services are being blamed. In this context came the Transparency International. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the kind of index or rating they come up with. Unfortunately, that has uh, given a new twist to the kind of uh, priorities of our various government departments. The preoccupation has been how to get a better on that ranking rather than getting at the service at the bottom level. The ranking is more misleading than helping to really correct or take the new initiatives to get at the bottom of the problem. So from that point of view, I think as has been said uh, by Mr. Bhargava, that the, the more close look at, because in each of the services, like in the case of Air India, has been very right, is a good example actually, uh, what I'm trying to say, that every service, whether it's PDS or electricity or water supply or any service, we have not really done an operations research and identify the weightages of uh, different uh, uh, issues that are responsible or contributing to the efficiency or corruption. Now, what we have been doing for the last 12 years is this. That is, uh, what are those particular uh, specific functions that a citizen encounters in the process the process. In the process, the systems, I agree with Mr. Bharatji, that the systems matter a lot more. It is in this context, the leadership and the ethics, unfortunately, has been bygone. And the first point that you made, one of the basic uh, reason why the trust, the trust that people have towards each other, within themselves, towards the institutions, towards the governing, has no longer been what it was. The decline in the trust is the problem of uh, getting into. Uh, I'll just give you an example that the television coming in and doing the kind of coverage they do of the corruption or uh, the delivery of the services. If any of you have examined it, when I mentioned about structure, the same issue or same uh, point has been uh, sometimes 24 times in the seven uh, in the day is is shown in the news bulletins. I'm not calling them new shows. Uh, they would like to call themselves uh, the new show, uh, but they're actually bulletins. Thereby what happened, the perceptions matter more today than the experience. This is a very important point unless you understand we will not uh, make a, the difference in terms of our outlook towards. See, today everybody says everything is corruption, everywhere corruption, everybody is corruption. This has become a more a fashion, in my opinion. The examining the last 12, corruption is there, corruption is a big problem, it needs to be addressed, and the seriousness with which it deserves to be addressed. Not just a cocktail kind of thing, or merely media reporting is going to take us far in terms of getting at the correctives that are required. Uh, the passive citizen will not be able to uh, do anything in that regard. I think the point that has been made, the passive, me passive media is one of the problems. I will not go into the details about the why, why the passiveness has come in, uh, why the, the, the trust not being there, the citizen becoming a uh, passive, all that I will not go into the details, but perhaps we can discuss. But the point I'm trying to say is that unless we get at the bottom of the problem, because whatever we have done in terms of movements, in terms of media coverage, in terms of so many books, so many research reports of the so many committees, None of them have really, they're all, you know, if you really see this since the 205 we have been tracking, the corruption is going up. I mean, that's both by in terms of perceptions as well as in terms of experience. The Transparency International gives a misleading kind of thing by going by perceptions. The perceptions in India since the proliferation of the television media has gone up very dif differently, as I said, 150% than what many other countries. So we can't compare uh, India in this regard with USA, for example, where the television has been there much longer there. But this in India, this is a more recent phenomenon. The television is creating havoc and misleading us. To, uh, in fact, one of the um, uh, one paper that I brought out 
has never been covered by the media because I said there is a decline in the corruption involving the citizen and uh, what I call the kicking upstairs of the corruption in India. Kicking upstairs means we see the 2G and many scan, scams and scandals are all kicking upstairs. But when it comes to the citizen, there are improvements, there are some uh, things, but that has not been written, that has not been talked, and it is not fashion to talk about it also. And coming to the, my last point, uh, Sukumaran, is, as has been said, the ecosystem, both in terms of the politics and as well as the economics. These two decisions, the kind of paradigm shift that has come, politics, as Bharatji has very rightly mentioned, we brought out uh, 207 in 29 states that uh, what percentage of the voters are paid money. You will be surprised to know there are states in India today, 60 to 75 percent of the voters are paid money. You will be surprised to know SC population are the poorest of the poor who takes the money. In Vasant Vihar, I'm giving you, in Vasant Vihar, 15 percent of the voters are paid money. In the just held uh, elections in Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh, 20 to 30 percent were paid money on the, the, the previous eight hours of the poll before they're going polls. So where is this money coming? This is all unaccounted money, as, as, as he rightly mentioned. There, there are so much studies that we have done about this. Unless we address this issue, we can't really get anywhere. What I call the three years ago, mother of all corruptions is this. So the political parties doesn't want to come under the RTI Act. I mean, this is really going, so this is the ecosystem. Similarly, the economics, the kind of market-oriented economy and consumerism that is proliferating, unless you address these issues, you can't really get at the uh, bottom of the governance, private sector or public sector. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of interesting points there. The, uh, I think uh, uh, one of the most significant points he made was, uh, uh, just to put it a little differently, and, and it's true, uh, is, is that instances of petty corruption have actually come down. One probable reason why instances of petty corruption have come down is because uh, instances of resource-based corruption, whether it's uh, spectrum or bilateral rights or anything of that sort, or mining rights, uh, have gone up because there's, there's far, far more money to be made in those than in petty corruption. Um, I, I know that what I'm going to say now is a contrarian view uh, because uh, two of the three panelists have, have highlighted saying the media has failed its role, media has failed its role, which is true. I, I don't think the Indian media has done enough. And uh, the unfortunate thing is, uh, in my profession, I'm a journalist, as all of you know, uh, journalists are the people who give journalism a bad name, right? Uh, it happens all the time. But I, but I still think, and, and this was a point that was missed out in the panel two, two sessions back when I think no one made this point, I think we actually have far better journalism of this country uh, coming out in this country now than, than was coming out in the past. Uh, we are ignoring this fact. Uh, we, are, we are listening to people who, to many minds, you know, stand up and say, when I was a journalist, I'm sorry, I won't hire those people. They wouldn't fit into my newsroom. They don't have the basic uh, requirements. If you look at uh, the kind of uh, database journalism, analytical journalism, opinion journalism, narrative journalism that's coming out in this country, across various media. I don't want to speak about television journalism because television journalism in many ways in this country uh, has regressed. India is probably one of the two or three markets in this world where you still have panels with more than six people or seven people uh, in, the, in the evening debates. You look, you look at any of the international channels, it's a one-to-one -one discussion or a one-to-two discussion, which really uh, helps you go into depth. But, but I really think the quality of journalism in this country is improved. And if uh, any one of you wants to email me, I can send you like 20 pieces a day, which, which, which really show that it's far better now than what was in the past. So I think there are lots of things wrong with the media, but I don't think we should beat, that, uh, beat media up. I, I know that everyone here has various points to uh, comment on. No, it's a reality that the media is a little more vigilant today than it was earlier. For example, in Air India's case in 2004, when our additional secretary, V. Subramaniam, got transferred overnight because he raised pertinent questions in the board meeting. Sunil Rora, who wrote to the cabinet secretary saying, I'm being pressurized to take a certain stance on certain decisions. They faced CBI inquiries, they got transferred, etc. Media did not do anything. But take the case of Kemka in Haryana. He's been highlighted by the, by the electronic media and the print media. So a change in the last six, seven years has come, which is a very welcome change. Now, we were talking in terms of my being depressed. You see, let's put it this way. I put the book in public domain. What was I expecting, okay? As I said earlier, media missed out 200 front page stories. Did they front page the stories now? I'm not saying it because it's my book. Let me explain to you. The fact is, certain things need to be put in public domain. You refer to the bilaterals. Subramanian Swami has gone to the Supreme Court challenging the bilateral rights given to Abu Dhabi to facilitate Jet Etihad deal. 
We read in today's paper, Qatar Airlines being given 20,000 more seats. Now, you see, people have failed to understand that this has a bearing on Indian aviation. Now, what's going to happen? Indigo, we all know, is a classy airline. You can, I'm not going to put Air India in the same league because people will have different kind of perspective. They are withdrawing the flights to Singapore from both Bombay and Delhi. Why are they doing it? Or take Jet Airways an airline which can match some of the international carriers, not having succeeded on any sector on which Air India was not operating flights. They were drawn flights from San Francisco, Johannesburg, Milan, you name any other sector that they launched flights. Why? Because foreign airlines were given a head start. They had 100 flights a week and operating into India, and when you operate one flight a day, you can neither match on advertising, marketing, cost, nor on the fair basis kind of a thing. Now, the question that I'm putting to the media is, the ministers, even if they know the kind of harm they're causing to the Indian aviation, are not going to admit because there are other considerations. But what stops the media from telling the minister that when he says, I'm giving more seats to Emirates or to Qatar or to Etihad or to Singapore Airlines, passengers will benefit with through lower fares, better frequency, short-term gain, long-term damage. So earlier, I could have admitted that, yes, journalists are not knowledgeable enough to know the full impact. But now that I put it in public domain, so next time Ajit Singh makes a statement that I'm giving 20,000 seats to Qatar Airways, question why, how, where, tell me what is the reason for it? How are you damaging GMR investment, GBK investment, and everything? You see, the reason why you had controversy on the Etihad deal for the first time and not in the previous cases, no, 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 no. Earlier, the harm was being caused only to Air India, because Air India was the sole international operator, of which there was no sympathy. And there was no lobbying done by Air India people, because as a government company, you can't lobby with the anything. But now when GVK, GM, G, GMR, GVK, Indigo, everybody got harmed because of the Jet Etihad deal, look at the kind of furrow it created. So unless you have total kind of A, knowledge, B, desire to protect national interest. And one reason why I very often say, look, I am going to support Modi this time, because you're talking of a nationalistic spirit. I want Indian interest to supersede every other interest first. And only then can perhaps we can deal with these issues of corruption and other kind of things. So future, I may be depressed at the moment, but may not be depressed for very long. Okay. Thank you. I'm taking off from where Jitender left, you know, this uh, spirit of a national understanding of what's good for all of us collectively. You know, I didn't mention this earlier, but the person who was introducing me did mention that I'm the general secretary of an organization called the Foundation for Restoration of National Values. It's called National Values precisely because there is a need for us to understand what is good for us collectively. So the president of this foundation is Dr. Sridharan, who made the Metro and who is now advising the coach in Metro and so on. And he and I together edited a book which was brought out by Sage called Restoring Values, Keys to Integrity, Ethical Behavior and Good Governance. And many of the ideas that we're discussing today are found in that. I would urge you to read that book. It's available probably at the, at the counter here. Now, I would like to make one final point to wrap up. And the point really is that there is no denying that irrespective of where you are in your profession as a citizen, we can all show leadership. We can all stand up for what we think is right. So that is something which I, I strongly urge all of us as citizens to do. You know, to say, Sarkar karegi or wo mantri karega. I'm sorry, we are a democracy. We are a republic where we have the right to cast a vote and we are more powerful than the people who come to administer or govern subsequently. But that said, there is also a need, in my opinion, to transform four things in this country immediately. Number one, we've got to bring about judicial and administrative reforms. Any nation where 30 lakh cases are pending across the states in the high courts is not dispensing justice. So where will you, how will you be able to stop corruption? You've got to have an enforcing agency that ensures that the right thing is done and you penalize the people who transgress that. So judicial and administrative reforms. Number two, police reforms. Today, in every state in the country, the police force is called a force. It's not a police service. And this police force is used 
as, in, as, a, as an instrument of the administrative agencies to coerce, to intimidate, to threaten, to kidnap. What kind of a democracy are we? So number two, police reforms. Number three, we have to make sure that electoral funding is made transparent and clean and ethical. And every single political party has got to play a role in that. Otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, be happy with what you have. Well, I think uh, uh, I will not uh, say much, uh, but this uh, book of mine, uh, The Good Governance, brought out by Sage, indicates uh, the kind of uh, points that I was trying to make. But after that, I have another book, which uh, brings out what Sukumaran has been saying, that the media today is much more proactive and uh, much more educative and much more database uh, proliferation of information and uh, although only 7% of the RTI queries are by journalists, but that apart, that is increasing very fast. But the point I'm making is, first and foremost thing is, I will not use the word leadership and all that, but the citizen becoming active, transforming himself or herself from a passivism to activism by taking more interest in the things around oneself is far more important today than anything. Second, confidence level need to be built up in ourselves instead of debunking everything around us. Celebrating the good things around you is far more important and significant than decay, you know, everything is bad and everything is, you know, saying that we are all corrupt and uh, the country is... Uh, the new book of mine is uh, unleashing the power of uh, news channels. The best, thereby what I'm saying is, what the government could not do in 64 years, the media, particularly the television, could do in six years if they are determined, if they are strategic, and if they are committed. Thank you. So, any one of you who has a question to ask, we will take all questions. What has happened to Air India is, of course, a very famous or rather an infamous case. And uh, at least on the ne in the net, a whole lot of articles have come. Why and how, what's happened to Air India? And uh, whatever you said about JRD, 25 years he was there, it was great. 78 when he left or other was thrown out. The, the question is, it's obviously come right from the top to destroy Air India. So, the way the whole politics works in India, you can do very little against a politician, especially in a case where it is hidden so very nicely. But unfortunately, even the professionals lower down in Air India seem to cooperate with everybody above and almost jointly it was destroyed. That is my uh, first question. Yeah, let's have first question answered first. You see, you are very right. A minister cannot do anything to Air India unless there is support from within. Because the system is that a proposal has to be mooted from within the organization. You would not have been able to justify the number of aircraft you bought, the merger that you got into, or the aircraft that you want to take on lease. It is, no, there is no denying, but what happens is that you have a minister and you have a pliable chairman. And the senior management people, many of them, let me explain to you, if you go back 30, 40 years ago, a chairman of a company was synonymous with the company. His interests were aligned with the company. But what we have witnessed in the last two decades or so is that chairman's interests are not fully aligned with the company. They are more kind, they're keen on working their own kind of interest and agenda. So when a senior management guy is asked to put in a proposal, he ought to be taking care of it. Is it in interest of the airline? Who is his employer? Because what they do generally is believe that the chairman, because he decides his destiny in terms of promotions, transfers, postings, etc., that what he says I need to be obliging him. Now, if the senior management people start making the distinction, as I have stated in the book, when I was asked to do certain things, I refused to do it, simply because I was against the company. You earn the wrath of the chairman, all right, but you're protecting the interest of the airline. So if senior management people are vigilant to this effect, that they are employees of the organization, not the chief executive, who is the incumbent chairman, probably they will be able to stop quite a bit of these wrong actions of the ministers. I have illustrated in some cases that I was asked to do a certain thing by certain ministers. I didn't do it. You face the consequences of it, but be bold enough because you, are the, you have to be loyal to the organization you are serving. That's the basic message. 
my my second question on the same point is um, Air India has been going downhill for the last about 20 years. But the last uh, six, seven years were the worst where it got a kind of, it was completely knocked out. Uh, and that coincides with the arrival of Mr. Praful Patel. Now, he's a very sophisticated gentleman and a politician. And from what one could see from the outside, it was he who was engineering the whole thing, almost deliberately the downfall of Air India. Would you agree with that? Yes, I have in my book described 2004-2008 period as the worst in Air India's history. Praful Patel was the chairman, Tulsi Das was the CMD. I've said so in words and described events date-wise on when happened, what happened, and why they were detrimental to Air India's long-term interests. My question is to um, Mr. Vaklu. You spoke actually about four things that you wanted to mention. You spoke about three things in terms of judicial, police reforms and uh, electoral funding that should be transparent. I'm a doctor. Uh, I want to know that do you have any, um, because you spoke about value systems, do you have any questions on, or suggestions in terms of health or health ministry? Well, I would take the whole evening to, to go into that area, but I'll, I'll leave just two thoughts with you. Yes, a lot of things in the, in the healthcare area need correction, need improvement. The first, of course, is doctors will need not to prescribe medications because they're giving, given gifts by companies, <coughs> point number one. Point number two, if a company, a private company or anybody says that please prescribe this medication and we'll give you a, a trip to Honolulu or whatever, don't say yes, ever. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is whenever you recommend a test to a patient Please ask yourself, is this really required or am I simply trying to earn money for the hospital that I work for? So, uh, I don't want to respond to anything further because we don't have any time. But live, work on these thoughts. We can talk offline. Okay, okay. great.